Welcome to a look at Hidden Games Crime Scene, case number one, the Maple Brook case. Thanks to Hidden Industries for sending us a copy of this murder mystery game to check out. Hidden Games Crime Scene Case 1 was published and designed by Hidden Industries, a company out of Germany. They first launched a series of games in Germany in 2019 and have been expanding out to other countries, finally hitting North America this year. Now, there are actually a total of 10 different versions of this first case, each of which has been localized to a different country and actually is changed and different in each case. Now, the copy I have is the Canadian version, which is called the Maple Brook case, but everyone actually has a unique name. No, this game is country specific. Mm. So you need the version for your country to fully enjoy the game for reasons we're gonna delve into as we go along. Now, when playing case one of Hidden Games, crime scene, players work together to answer four questions. How did the suspect die? Who sent you the envelope? Who sent you the torn letter? And who committed the crime? Now, to solve this case and get these answers, the players are presented with a plethora of information, both in the form of physical clues in different formats and digital breadcrumbs leading you online into your phones. Now, in particular, the Maple Brook case has you solving the murder of Max Glover, who died at the county fair in Maple Brook, B.C. Since this is a mystery game and we don't want to spoil anything, we didn't record an mm. unboxing video for this one. Now, what I will say here is the variety and quality of the evidence included in this game is very impressive. Of all the murder mystery games I've played so far, this one has the best components with the biggest variety. It doesn't feel like someone just spent 10 minutes at their laser printer and then just stuffed everything in an envelope and sent it to us. Inside the case file envelope, which is a, like a big manila sized envelope made out of cardboard, you're going to find things printed on various types of paper. You've got newsprint, letterhead, there's a business card, there's a flyer, there's some lined paper that's been written on and more. You also get a poster corkboard for taking notes on and a calendar for tracking dates. Now, are there yarn and pins? You can do the whole... You could, technically, but it's actually already there on the cork board. Right. Now, one minor annoyance we did have is the fact the calendar and cork board are on that... They're the last thing in the envelope. So what we did, there, like I said, there's a ton of stuff in here. Like, it's like you're pulling out sheet after sheet after sheet. And what we did was, like, pulled out a sheet, kind of looked at it for clues, and then passed it to someone else, and pulled out another one, and then passed it around, then pulled out another one. Don't do that. Don't don't take things out one at a time and scour them for clues before moving on to the next. Instead, like, dump the whole thing and go through it quickly before you start taking notes, because you'll eventually realize, oh, this is here for us to use to take notes and keep things organized. As for physical components... I, I hated the stuff that the poster was printed on. It's poster paper. And if you ever tried to use a ballpen pen on a poster paper, you understand exactly what I'm complaining about here. I want something that's easy to write on, to put my notes on. So we had to go find a Sharpie to keep keep playing. But we ruined, I think, two pens just trying to get this through because that poster coding doesn't work so great with writing on. So what exactly are you doing with all of this evidence? All right. So one of the first things you're going to find is... In, in this is a sheet telling you what to look at, what look for. Now, honestly, it's actually the same thing that's on the back of the envelope that has the same instructions in case you actually miss it because you do dump everything on the table or if you just get distracted looking at stuff. So the point of the game, the goal of the game is to answer four questions. Now, in Maple Bruce specifically, it's how did Max Glover die? Who sent you the envelope, the big envelope? Who sent the torn letter, which is something you'll discover inside it? And who committed the crime? Now, you're going to use the evidence to answer these questions. Now, in addition to the physical elements provided, a number of the clues are going to lead you to look online, where you'll need to do things like call a voicemail inbox, look up someone on Facebook, hack into a police database, and more. Now, again, to help you organize things, you get pages from a date book, which you can use to track who was where when and when key things happen, perfect for finding alibis. And then there's the poster sized picture of the cork board with images of all the parties. And it's got every person who's mentioned in any of the evidence with a picture of them and notes. And one of the things we totally missed the first time through is some of that's pre-filled out and is required to solve some of the issues in the case. 
So you're not just cutting up paper strips and playing with a few doodads in the box. Mm. Unlike some of the uh, the more minor escape room type games, for instance, this takes some actual research. Yeah. Though I'm certainly hoping that unlike checking Facebook, you're not actually hacking a police database. No, you go to a specific website and it requires a password and there's stuff in the thing to help you figure out that password, which leads you to a bunch of files. And some of the files are encrypted and there's stuff, it's not real, but it does give you that feel that you're doing that. Like you are going to a website and it looks like an official Maple Brook police record. Now, once you've figured out your answers to the four questions, you go online to a specific website and check to see if you're correct. Now, in addition to having the proper answers and how you should have reached what you what you came to and, and what the proper answer is, but like, they actually walk through it. Like, because of this, 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 and this, you should have figured this out. This is also where you'd go if you need hints. And what it does is it gives you a huge selection of all the stuff that's in there and you can click on it. And the very basic clues are very basic. Like don't feel at all guilty for clicking on the first clue that just basically says that read this part of the page and basically gives you an ind indication that, oh, you should be looking at this if you weren't yet. Now, what this also does, which I like, is it gives you access to some of the technology required to play the game if you didn't have it. So if you don't have a Facebook account, you can actually go through and click on the part that says Facebook, and you're going to have to go through about three hints before it'll actually show it to you, but they will give you the Facebook page eventually. So while reliance on technology is one aspect that could be a negative, the yeah. fact that you can't accidentally see the answers by looking at that one wrong sheet of paper that mm -hmm. comes with the game is a nice benefit. Agreed. Now, unlike the various exit games and other murder mystery games we played, there's no timer here. There's no score either. There's no no, no real goal. Uh, basically, the evidence lists the game, as, sorry, the envelope lists the game taking an hour to an hour and a half. Um, or sorry, an hour and a half to two and a half hours. 1.5 to 2.5 hours. Uh, it took us about an hour and 45 minutes to before we were confident looking up our answers. We probably could have looked them up earlier, but we were double checking things and making sure. I did find it weird not to get some kind of score. Like it just, that that part of the game felt missing or a timer, like just a rank. You did great, you did bad, you did this. It just felt a little strange. All right, well, now that we've got a good idea of how you solve this mystery, how would you share some thoughts on how it played? So the biggest thing that really impressed me right from tearing the envelope the first time is the quality of the components and the amount. They really stuffed this envelope full. This is a step above every other murder mystery game I played, both in regards to the quality of the evidence and the level of detail and the variety. So it's great to see that people aren't doing the bare minimum here. It's so easy to just... Work out the clues, print them out in bulk at your local FedEx store, stuff them in envelopes, and you're done. No, this was extremely well produced. Uh, the other thing that I really liked, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, in the Maple Brook case is it did a great job of immersing you into the game. The entire point of it is someone sent you this envelope, and yes, it looks like an envelope. No, it doesn't fold open right. Like they, If they had realized how they were going to pack it, they probably could have made it look even more official, but it's really good. And then the spot where it should have return to sender, it says stamped on it something, I forget exactly what it says, but it's something like sender unknown, right? Like they did a really good job of like, making an AR aspect of this, right? An, an augmented reality. This could be a real thing. You get things like maps and, in, in, and there's a Google map showing multiple routes to places. You get business cards, flyers. You even get a, a small town newspaper that makes Maple Brook, BC feel real, like a real place with a real murder. And then there's the online touches. Like the designers of this game went and took the time to create a fake business websites and they made Facebook pages for people that are in this so they look like real people. While this is great for immersion, it did lead to uh, what I would say is probably the biggest problem with this game is that it needs more than what's in the box. And it requires things that not every gamer may have. Now, I guess say cell phones are pretty ubiquitous, but not everyone has one. And not everyone who has a cell phone has a Facebook account, for example. Now, the company does provide their website, which you don't if, if you don't have access to everything. Like if you, you can't call the 1-800 or sorry, call the phone number to get the, the voicemail, or if you can't get online, you can go to this webpage and get the hint. The problem is you got to click through all the clues first to see what you need to see. Though I have to admit by a time, like you get to that Facebook page, you should have already solved the other stuff, but you could just be like going on Facebook, searching Maple Brook case or something instead of the specific person you're looking for. So it's just, it's not optimal. And then while, 
you still need internet. You need to have the internet to view this page at all, to see the hints and to see if you won. There is nothing in the box that tells you the answers. Well, I think we are reaching a point for better or worse, where we can assume that everyone who is in a position to buy a game like this mm -hmm. has internet and likely a phone. It does still make me wonder running a website costs money. Yeah. Not a lot to be sure, but it is not free and it's an ongoing cost. How long is the company willing to maintain the cost? Because mm -hmm. the game is dead once that website is gone, no matter how many copies are left on the shelves. Well, again, everything's still on their web page. So if Facebook shut down the account and the fake hack into the cops thing, they lose the licensing for that and the the other places you go online, sorry, I'm trying not to spoil anything. If they lost access to all that, you could still get through all of it on their clue page. And well, that'd mean the game would have to, like the company would have to go to business. It's the company's webpage where you'd go to buy a copy of the game. So in a way that's fair, but it's definitely a valid concern that five years from now, if I happen to have a copy of this around, I never cracked open, you may not be able to play it if that website's gone. Yep. Now, another thing that annoyed me a lot, and it, maybe it shouldn't bug me that much, but it bugged me a lot personally, is there is a voicemail number to call. And it's not a 1-800 number. Now, it is a Canadian number. It's actually a BC number with a BC area code. It is a long-distance call from here in Windsor. Now, thankfully, one member of our family has free unlimited calling for Canada. And yes, that is pretty much common with most cell phone plans. But it's not something everyone has. And to be honest, when we locked down, when, when COVID hit, we stripped that out of our phones because we're not planning on going anywhere. We removed roaming and, and, and all Canada-wide calling because I wasn't expecting to drive up to Toronto or anything anytime soon and to need it. So, yes, you can get around this by clicking through the clues on the web page and listening to the voicemail there. I was just put off by having to call and pay to call someone. Yeah, well, I mean, at least they do have options not to spend. The website, while perhaps frustrating, is better than getting hit with an unexpected phone bill for a game you already yeah. bought. I just, like I said, it just seems strange. Though I'm sure that's part of the localize. At least they didn't want me to call Germany. <laughs> so that was slightly better. So I guess the localization helped. Now, as for actually sitting down and playing this game is a lot of fun. Um, the sheer amount of information you are provided with is impressive and overwhelming, but in a good way. It was just like, I, I, it felt like a clown car, the amount of stuff I just kept falling out of this. And inside this envelope was another envelope that had stuff inside that envelope. And I love the variety of clue types, like, like all kinds of things that were well done and made you feel clever. And honestly, that's what should be in every escape room puzzle murder mystery game is I want to feel clever. That's the point of these games. I want to feel good about my mental prowess being able to solve things. Many of the clues required deductive reasoning. There was an awful lot of process, process of elimination, and there was even a math puzzle as part of the game. What I appreciate most, though, for almost every answer, there were multiple clues leading to that answer, giving the same answer. And this was awesome for two reasons. The first being you could miss something and still solve the case. So you didn't have to discover every single clue in the end, every single clue, and how they connect. That wasn't necessary to, to, to win the game. The second thing is that when you had a theory, Finding multiple sources for a suspected answer was awesome to go, yeah, we got that right. So not only do we know the license plate, we also know the pizza. And you put those together. So therefore, note I'm making these up. These may, may or may not have anything to do with the case. By the time we decided to enter our answers online, we were confident. We we're like, oh, no, we got this. We got that. It's definitely this. It's definitely this. Oh, but what about this? Yeah, I guess there's a small chance, but we're pretty in like... And it felt really good that we literally had everything right. Like when it went through the first, you should realize that blah, blah, blah. And this happened here. And then because of that, this, and this person's connected to this, and this is this, you should get to this result. Like we are like, yep, 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 exactly. And it felt so good. Now, when you start talking about puzzles, you talked about the immersion of all the different pieces, but it did at any time feel too much like playing a game and not enough like trying to actually you know, be detective solving a crime. Did any of the puzzles no. pull you out of that immersion? No, the only puzzle was to figure out someone's password. And it fit because it was someone left an obscure thing to help remind them of their password that not everyone's going to get right away. Most of it was, like I said, like a deduction and, 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 and cor cor collaboration, collaborating. Is that the word? I could 
corroborating evidence, I think is the word. Corroborating. Where you find corroborating. That's the word I was looking for. Sorry, my fail at English there. Corroborating evidence, listening to interviews, catching the right per- piece of information, like little things would get slipped out because there, there were interviews you listened to with actual people talking and it was extremely well done. And like I said, puzzle wise, there was one puzzle that I admit we tried about four times because it was a wrong password. Like, all right, what are we doing wrong? And it was a word based math puzzle that was definitely difficult enough. It stumped us for a little while. Right. Now, another aspect I appreciate about this particular murder mystery experience is it wasn't adult. Like, yes, there was a murder, but there was no gore. There were no pictures of the crime scene. There were no dead bodies to look at. There were no implements to see. There was literally zero horror or shock value in this game, which would make this a relatively family friendly experience. So at the time we like, if I had known better, I would have invited our older oldest daughter to play with us, but we didn't know sitting down to play because it's highly likely. It's like, here's the crime scene with dead body. She wouldn't have liked that. Yeah. It's always a good thing. There's nothing wrong with letting your kids know murder is a thing. Yeah. It's explaining the blood splatters that you might want to avoid. Yeah. There was none of that in this whatsoever. So overall, we had a great time playing through Hidden Games Crime Scene, the Maple Brook case. Um, we played three players, myself, my wife, my mother-in-law. Uh, we felt it was like perfect difficulty level and length. It, it didn't overstay its welcome. We never ended up overly frustrated. The clues were just difficult enough to make you feel smart when you figured them out. And, and especially we love the, the corroborating evidence. See, if I'd scroll down, I used that word later and I spelled it so I could say it <laughs> to help confirm our theories. I, I actually really appreciate that a lot. Any other, even the escape games that I played, there was always just the one solution, the one way to go. And if you missed any part of that, you were lost. Whereas this, like, oh, I found it here and then this and the two together. Yes, we got it. I love the feeling that that gave. And, and I felt good with how we did at the end. And that's really what matters, that you enjoyed taking part in this experience. So the game is a cardstock version of a manila envelope, right? It's stuffed full of evidence of various types. And it that combined with the modern technology use really makes you feel like feel like this is a real case like like someone sent you an envelope and is help, looking for your help to try to solve it right it sends players out into the web looking for additional clues while other players are sifting through everything if you're a fan of murder mystery games i strongly recommend picking up hidden games crime scene case number one whatever localized version they sell in your region which you'll have to determine for yourself now, if you've never tried one of these games before, if you've never done the murder mystery thing before, or even, the, you know, an evening of murder, any of those, I think this would be a great starting point to see if you enjoy murder mystery games. You may or may not. This would be a good way to find out. I think the quality of this product, plus the way it keeps things zoomed out, right? No gore, no no, no looking at police pictures and, and, and uh, morgue reports, right? I think this would be a great first mystery game for someone. Now, for someone who's had some not so great experience with these types of games, but are willing to give them another shot, I also recommend checking this out. So far, this is the tightest, most well done murder mystery game we played. If you don't dig trying to solve murders, looking through piles of evidence and trying to make connections and check alibis, this isn't going to be for you. I do have one other thing I want to mention on replayability. The hidden games, crime scene games, are meant to be one and done games. And the company will probably hate the fact I'm mentioning this, but that doesn't have to be the case, at least with this first case. There is nothing here that you need to destroy. There's nothing you need to fold, cut, or write on. Yes, it gives you a date book and a calendar to keep notes on, but there's no reason you have to use those. You could do it on a scrap piece of paper, which I wish we had done, because then I could pass my copy of my game on to someone else and they could experience it. So unlike many of the exit games, nothing destroyed, totally replayable, as long as you don't write on the stuff that comes in the game. Well, that's it for our look at Hidden Games Crime Scene Case Number One. When you've got time, be sure to check out the review section of the blog over at tabletopbellhop.com for a more detailed look at this murder mystery game.